Eu vi brilhar, eu vi No meio da mata, eu vi A pena de prata do caboclo Guaraci Eu vi brilhar, eu vi No meio da mata, eu vi A pena de prata do caboclo My Maya ancestors built pyramids and other buildings to record solar alignments at key times of the year. The equinoxes, when day and night are of equal length, mark the transitions between the rainy and dry seasons in the Yucatan. The equinoxes remind us in March that it is time to prepare our cornfields for planting, and in September we need to get ready for the harvest. Our ancestors built temples to honor the sun. The Great Pyramid at Chichen Itza has four staircases with 91 steps each, plus a temple on top. The sum total of these steps, plus the temple, equals 365, which is a reference to the number of days in a solar year. During the equinoxes, a fascinating thing happens when triangles of light and shadow appear on the side of the pyramid. After the last triangle takes shape, the sun shines on a giant serpent's head carved from stone at the bottom of the staircase. This entire effect resembles a snake slithering down the pyramid. Our grandparents tell us that this snake is Kukulkan, the feathered serpent, the slithering snake of light that brings the energy of the sun to the earth for planting. At sunrise in the ancient city of Tzibilchaltun, the sun shines through the main portal, transforming the building into the shining face of the sun. In our tropical homelands, the sun can be seen directly overhead twice a year, marking an important event that astronomers call the zenith passage. When the sun is at the zenith, the shadows of vertical objects disappear. The zenith passage was tracked by using solar alignments with buildings and other structures in ancient Maya cities. At Ushmal, the zenith passage can be observed by watching the shadows of the vertical monuments disappear at midday. At Chichen Itza, on the day of the zenith passage, the sun sets behind the great ball court in precise alignment with the Chakmol statue. The opposite of the zenith is a nadir passage of the sun, when the sun is directly underneath us at midnight. This astronomical event was also known to our ancestors. In Palenque, the nadir passage is marked by the alignment of architectural features with the sun at sunrise and sunset on that specific day. In the land of the oldest Maya cities, the sun is at the nadir, or directly underneath, in early November. It is no coincidence that Day of the Dead happens then too, because this is when the sun is visiting with our ancestors in the underworld. Maya astronomy is thus recorded in our ancient buildings and lives through the traditions that are still practiced today in our homelands. The heavenly sun was revered for the everlasting presence, the Alpha and the Omega, creator of life and the one who sustains life. No living being has ever been able to draw near to the sun in all of his glory. No man can stare into the sun for very long without damaging his eyes or becoming blind. Because of this, the sun sits as the supreme judge of the nations. Only those without blemish can walk in the presence of his rays. Those who are blemished or evil, in other words sickly, cannot bear to walk under the rays of the sun or even to glare towards it. The great sun served as the representative of the father's son and his wife as the mother, much like the pharaohs from ancient Egypt or Kemet. The great sun was responsible for the preservation and upholding of the tribal nation's feasts, laws, traditions, languages, etc. that were passed down generation to generation from the first ancestors. If a drought was to fall upon the nation, the great sun would fast for nine days or more, not drinking or eating. During this time, he shelters himself and avoids interaction with women. This is to reflect the heavenly sun's activities when before it rains. Often before rainfall, the sun is hidden by the clouds. So as above, so below, the great sun shelters himself in the temple and conjure up the water and air spirits in order to bring rainfall to his people. In the temple of the great sun, 
burned an eternal fire that came directly from the father and mother son in the heavens. Two guards were in charge of tending to the fire so that it continues to burn. This fire was sacred because it was fire that was created naturally from the heat of the sun. In fact, it was so sacred that if the fire was to die out, the people would become very fearful as it signified that a bad omen was bound to happen. If the guards failed to keep the fire burning, they were immediately put to death. Man-made fire was forbidden in the temple of the great sun. It was rumored that long ago, a guard allowed the eternal fire to die out, so he lit the fire back up using a pipe. As a result, many of the children of the sun were struck with illnesses and died until he confessed four years later at his deathbed. Among the indigenous civilizations in which sun worship was prevalent, an ancient hierarchy originating from South America was upheld. The largest class was the lower class known as the Stinkards. The highest class was the children of the sun. In order to be a child of the sun, one must be born of a woman who is a son. It is only through the maternal lineage that one can become the great son. The great son held the highest position and authority over the entire tribal nation. The only group of people who could override the great son's authority were the tribal chiefs and elders. Their words and wisdom was considered as important as the words from an oracle among the people. When a male son dies, his family and servants commit suicide in order to be with him in the afterlife. This was a common tradition so that the family and servants may not be mistreated by the new son and servants who rise into power. For this reason, female sons very often refuse to marry male sons, but instead would marry and have children with men from even the lowest class, the stinkards. And from that union are male sons created. Below the great son were many little sons, both male and female. If the great son was to die, the eldest male son of the female son, who is the most closely related to the great son's mother, typically the son of the mother's sister, then next the son of the mother's daughter, is appointed the position. Underneath are the nobles. The nobles are children of noble mothers and stinkered fathers, or son fathers and stinkered mothers. Remember that one can only be a son if his or her mother is a son. It does not matter if the father is the son. Beneath the nobles are the honored people who are children of honored mothers and stinker fathers or noble fathers and stinker mothers. Then lastly are the stinkers. Notice the trend of the upper classes marrying people from the lower class. Because of this, generational poverty and lower class status was nearly unheard of. The children of the son were also considered to be white. White was a social ranking that belonged to the children of the sun. Though many indigenous Americans were classified as Negro or Black, many more of higher status were classified as white. It wasn't until much later that being white became associated with being a pale-skinned European here in the Americas. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe for more videos.